uh, that's absolutely fantastic. So, so perhaps now is the time to ask you, uh, how does your famous uh, pro-actionary principle fits within the general transhumanist philosophy? And how is it different from the widely popular uh, precautionary principle against uh, which it, it comes, philosophically speaking? Well, the proactionary principle um, is a response to the precautionary principle that I developed uh, with the input of quite a few people at an online summit. We call it the Vital Progress Summit, uh, some number of early in the early in the two thousands. And my motivation was that our culture, curiously, we're the we're already at the peak of our culture. If you look at it historically, we're wealthier than ever, healthier than ever, longer lived than ever. Um, even in the United States, where people eat very badly and uh, pay too much for medical care, we just increased our life extent, our life expectancy. Yesterday, it was said to a new high, despite all those challenges. And so, interestingly we, we enough, you live in the diabetes and stroke belt of the United States, by the way. Uh, really, I don't think Arizona is as bad as, uh, as some of the other. I thought Texas areas is in the south. Oh, I'm in I'm in Arizona now, but yeah, Texas Texas is pretty bad. Yeah. Um. Okay, now I've just... Uh, so, sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> Where was I? Yes. We were talking about the precautionary principle. Oh, right, right. The... So, right. So uh, I was seeing that there was a, despite being at the sort of the height of our progress, historically speaking, people seem to be obsessed with caution, with holding back and being afraid, which is, it's strange because if you go back to you know, Paleolithic days, people had to survive every day. They had to go out and hunt their food. Uh, they could die at any time. They could fall over a rock and break their head. There's no medical care. So they had good reason to be cautious. Uh, today, we have hospitals and doctors and grocery stores and you know, food stockpiles. And so we're a lot more resilient. And yet our culture, bizarrely, has never been more cautious. We're afraid of everything these days. Uh, just about any energy source, for instance, uh, especially right now, topically nuclear power, Absolutely. many people are expressing their fears about that without looking at uh, you know, the benefits, the costs and the benefits, they just see a problem and they magnify that and take it out of context and they don't, they don't think comparatively either. So what we have, especially in the sustainability movement and the green movement is essentially any useful energy technology you mentioned, they say, well, we can't have that because it's, it's going to cause problems. Um, we have people trying to stop genetic engineering and genetic research. We have lots of people opposed to life extension research. Um, we had the President's Council under Leon Cass, uh, backed up by people like Francis Fukuyama, all warning about the dangers of technological progress. Even Bill Joy, a technologist, saying that you know we've got to stop. Bill McKibbing saying enough in the title of his book. So uh, people might say, well, technological progress is inevitable. We don't need to you know be no loud, noisy transhumanists. But in fact, you think historically, things can stop. They can reverse. They can go backwards. And uh, even if they don't stop, you can slow them down, and that might kill us because. Until we have real life extension breakthroughs, we have a limited amount of time. So I think it's important to keep up the rate of progress. And the precautionary principle essentially says, don't try any new technology. Don't allow it. It's too dangerous. If there's any chance that it could have bad effects, which of course it will, you have to learn by, by grappling with those, uh, then it says you should stop progress. The proactionary principle, by contrast, tries to take a more balanced view, uh, looking at the costs and the benefits. Uh, it urges us to use the most objective methods and the most creative and objective methods for thinking about these issues rather than being driven by fear. And there are a whole set of, of components to that, but that's basically the motivation. And that clearly fits in with transhumanism because transhumanist goals depend very much on technological progress, on some fundamental breakthroughs. Uh, and if we, if we slow down that progress, if we stop it, uh, even in certain areas, then transhumanism is not going to be realized. So let me push you just a little bit more here on that issue about the proactionary principle. I mean, a critic might say, take the current crisis uh, with the potential or actual partial meltdown at the Japanese nuclear reactors. Uh, so one could say, for example, something like, sure. well, if you were a little bit wiser and more cautious in applying the precautionary principle, that whole crisis could have been averted. So we... we probably shouldn't have built that nuclear reactor the way we built it. Maybe we shouldn't have built one there at all. I mean, there was a, a critic who said it was crazy uh, for Japan, which is one of the most seismically active countries in the world, to have 55 nuclear reactors. So all those critics obviously come from the precautionary 
principle. So what would your response from the proactionary point of view be to that? Well, of course, it's always easy to criticize decisions in hindsight. <laughs> but um, I, you know, I think there is some point to uh, the criticism of the siting of those reactors. Uh, but one thing you have to remember is that this earthquake, which nobody seems to quite agree on the magnitude, an 8.9 or 9.0, that's a once in a thousand years size earthquake. So it, it's not really completely crazy that they didn't consider that size of an earthquake. They did actually plan for uh, quakes of you know, 8.3 or 8.4, uh, and it probably would have survived that. Um, so you could argue, well, they shouldn't have sighted those reactors there, they should have kept it away from the water, but they thought that was so unlikely. And then even if it does happen, what actually is the outcome? Uh, a lot of people, I think, are, are catastrophizing about this. It is a bad thing, but uh, and it hasn't finished playing out yet. But you have to also compare how many people are killed by other energy sources on a daily basis from emissions, uh, also from things like dam bursts. If you look up the numbers on number of people killed, especially in places like India and China from dams bursting, it's staggering. It's a lot more than even this incident at the worst is going to do. Uh, even one incident can kill tens of thousands of people, uh, over 100,000 people for the worst dam bursts. Uh, the mutagens and carcinogens spewed into the atmosphere by fossil fuels are more invisible because they're spread out. They're not focused in one place where you can put it on the news and take photos and go over it with helicopters. But it doesn't mean it's not killing people. So you have to take all that into account. I would say that if people had applied the proactionary principle, that incorporates the best parts of the precautionary principle. It doesn't say go ahead and do whatever you feel like doing. It says think very carefully and critically here. What options do you have? That would include sighting options, uh, what kind of power station, uh, whether to build it at all. Uh, it requires you to take all those considerations into account. So it doesn't dismiss caution. Um, and I would say that uh, people opposing nuclear power because of this doesn't make a lot of sense because you don't get that kind of, well, even in Japan, you don't get earthquakes that powerful, usually, very rarely. Uh, but in other parts of the world, it can be very stable. Here in Arizona, we don't have earthquakes. And that's one reason that we, the Alcor Foundation moved here. Um, and also, you have to take into account that these reactors are 40 years old. They were actually designed back in the 60s. And there are much more, there are even safer reactor designs now, which will shut down automatically. So I'm actually, you know, I'm not a big fan of this president in general, but I'm actually pleased that he apparently so far has not said we're going to shut down all our nuclear power stations. He seems to still be saying we should go ahead. And I think that still makes sense. So in, in your estimate, it does make sense to continue building more nuclear reactors? Yes, but I'd like to see the newer designs. I'd like to see uh, the safer designs, the ones that don't require that you do a lot of things to shut them down, that basically will shut themselves down unless you uh, have input. I'd like to see the uh, you know, thorium reactors worked on and various other designs. Um, uh, there are a number of designs which are a lot safer than the ones that we're talking about from 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> well, uh, let me see. Um, one of your famous quotes <laughs> that I found here was uh, this one. We have achieved two of the three alchemists' dreams. We have transmitted, transmuted the elements and learned to fly. Immortality is next. So, would you like to elaborate on why do you think immortality is next? Well, I wrote that some time ago, and I have to say that today I don't use the term immortality. Um, but Aurelia Gray is very careful to avoid that word. Yeah, I haven't used it in a number of years. It's, it's unfortunate because it's an easy, it's a single word, nice and brief, uh, and it's hard to write something you know, snappy like that if you use a longer term. Um, but the, so I wouldn't say immortality because that implies uh, a guarantee of, of never dying, never perishing ever, which I don't think anybody can guarantee. It also tends to have religious connotations. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I would say super longevity or uh, indefinitely extended lifespan like that. Um, yeah, the idea behind that was essentially the, the alchemists were proto-scientists. They were trying to do science before they had scientific method. So you've got to give them a lot of credit for, you know, they actually did make some progress too. Um, but using modern science, we have been able to achieve two of those goals. We can fly using you know, machines. Uh, we can transmute elements, very great expense and lots of energy, but it's, it is possible. So that leaves the, the final great alchemist goal. Um, of extending the human lifespan. And to me, that is uh, the most important goal for our civilization, because what's happening right now is a holocaust. Essentially, millions of people are dying. Every year we're dying in huge numbers, one at a time. So again, we don't, don't think it's so bad because we don't see them uh, all being shot to death in one place. But it is just as bad. There are huge numbers of deaths going on. And we're just saying, oh, well, that's just natural. 
And to me, that's not acceptable. The fact that it's natural doesn't make it okay. Uh, we need to stop people from aging. We need to stop people from dying. Um, and those who die before we have adequate technology should be put into cryopreservation. The fact that this is not a standard practice to me is, is kind of stunning. And I think we will look back at this point from the future and we'll say, what were these people thinking? <laughs> they just, they did nothing. They threw people away when they legally died. Uh, they didn't do much to extend their lifespans. They weren't funding it, uh, except in a totally trivial amount. They were spending huge amounts of money on building weapons and on funding programs that don't do anything very useful. They weren't doing anything about fundamental aging problems. It was left up to essentially a few teeny private groups and individuals to try and fund this. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Aubrey de Grey, who is another um, anti-aging or super longevity enthusiast, um, often refers to, I think, about 100,000 people per day who are dying from old age and has very serious problems with the term natural death. Uh, he just <laughs> really cannot bear to stand hearing that term, I think. Um, so is that the motivation behind your work, sort of achieving super longevity? Now that we've achieved the other two goals that the alchemists have set for themselves. Is that Max Moore's driving motivation? That's certainly a big part of it. Yeah, it's, it doesn't come on its own because if you talk about extending lifespan radically, then it changes everything. It's going to change uh, how generations relate to one another, how our organizations are structured, how politics works, how people lead, uh, how you have a turnover of leaders. It's going to change a lot of things. And critics who say, well, you're going to change everything. Uh, well, they're right. It probably will change an awful lot of things. Uh, so you have to think about life extension also in terms of uh, the other changes that transhumanists want. Just living a lot longer, well, that, that's, that sounds pretty good to me, but I also want to know that I can continue to improve myself, that we can each uh, improve ourselves emotionally, intellectually, uh, and socially. So that all, that, all that really works together. So it's not a goal on its own. Um, uh, it really goes along with all the other transhumanist goals. But I think it's the one that requires the most emphasis right now because it's simply... Uh, is, is neglected and it's crucial. We can wait to build super artificial intelligence. We, we can wait to build nanotechnology. We can wait to build great spaceships if we live a lot longer. But the other way around isn't going to, well, arguably some people think if we build great AI, it will solve the aging problem, and perhaps. But to me, you know, conquering aging, or at least postponing it, has got to be the number one priority. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this, by the way, this kind of attitude reminds me very much of a book that I just recently read by Kevin Kelly, where he says that human is a process, not an entity. Yes, yeah, I, uh, I agree with that, essentially. Yeah. 